Uh, the band had several names to start with. What was the first one, Guy? 48 Hours, I believe. Uh, what, Fanatics. Gene Carson's Fanatics. Was that one of them? That was the first one, wasn't it? Hard to remember so now. Many. But it was, I think it was Gene Carson's Fanatics to start with, and then 48 Hours. Pablo thought of the name 48 Hours. Pablo's the drummer. He thought of that one, didn't he? And yeah, See, the well, we couldn't decide on a name, so we, we kept changing them all the time until we came out of one we liked, and that's yeah. where we kept changing that's them right. around. So. The Dials, Gene Carson's um, Fanatics, um, 48 Hours was one, but that was a problem because The Clash came up with a song of the same name. Uh, and then 909, although just after that, Strummer was seen, I think, at the Rainbow with 909 here on his shirt. You can still see the image now, but we weren't going to change it again, so we, ch we chose 909. John Watson thought of it, and we had a song called Emergency. We couldn't think of anything <laughs> that we liked that was stuck. It's not the best thing to start up a following without a, you know, a proper name, so everyone coming out each week with a different name, mm -hmm. but luckily the scene at the time, people knew you know, who, who, who we were going out as, so people did turn up. But also, you know, I mean, I, I changed my name because I used to work with Ian Dury and um, we wanted to start, when we started 999, we wanted to start, I wanted to start completely new and not have any of the people coming down to see the Kilburn and the High Road. So I changed my name to Nick Cash and, um, you know, so that was a name change there as well. But, um, which worked really because we were the first gigs we played with the Hope and Anchor, Red Cow and uh, Northampton cricket club and you know people it's all started new it was like a fresh audience really not, not I didn't want sort of 50 people coming down who knew Kilburn and the High Rose because it would have been like a bit of a false start you know and then it was really good because I mean that punk thing was happening anyway you know and our first gig was at Northampton County Cricket Club mm. was stretch was stretch yeah wouldn't Who let would us use their PA so we had to use the little little Wem Collin thing mm. uh, they had a great big one blaring out but it didn't seem to affect how we went down yeah, I first heard about 999, well, we were contemporaries really, because I was in the Lurkers in 77, I made the first two singles, and we played a lot with 999 at places like the Red Cow and the Nashville Rooms in London and uh, the seminal punk venue, the Hope and Anchor in Islington. So yeah, I, I've known a lot of the guys since 77, and then we had the same management in 79 when I had a band called Pinpoint. We had Albion management and we used to play a hell of a lot together then, so I've known them that long. Even though I've only been in the band 16 years, Nick asked me about 16 years ago if I'd like to join. Because he knew I had the Lurkers back together, so I'd do both bands. I met Nick for his association with Kilburn and the High Roads, and then, then we started auditioning for drummers down at the King's Road. And uh, Where was that place down there? In Lots Road, wasn't it? Lots Road Studios. Yeah. yeah. And uh, through that, we had a lot of. Uh, drummers and musicians coming in and out so we met sort of half the uh, would-be drummers and musicians in the punk scene anyway auditioning back then in 76 and not it? 76. We put an advert in the back of the Melody Maker yeah. you know because Guy and I were already together writing songs and um, we put an advert in the back of the Melody Maker saying he wanted you know uh, a bass player for a punk rock group which at the time was sort of quite an outrage. Not many people had heard of it really you know and uh, we got a, quite a lot of replies and we got John Watson he came down straight away. Well, first of all, we got Pablo. The no, he's Pablo was last. No, 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 no he was right. right. He was last. Gone already, yeah. <laughs> we got John Watson, and then to ages to get a drummer. And the, the amount of drummers that came through was it Dolphin from. He played with Stiff Little Fingers, fingers. didn't he? And Tom Robinson Band. Yeah. John Moss from Culture Club. He came down. Yeah, loads of them. Yeah. Terry Terry Chimes was involved a little bit at one point. Who used to drum with the Clash, and. Uh, but, uh, and then from there, it just took off doing gigs, and we, we got signed up pretty much straight away. Mm. It was quite exciting, really, wasn't it, Guy? Because Guy and I had written some songs and sort of submitted them to the record companies, and they didn't like them at all, you know. And then this punk rock thing came along, and the sort of same songs, you know, instantly they were snapping them up because of the punk rock sort of sensation, you know. And we were getting like telegrams from people like Mickey Mo saying, "Want to sign you? Want to sign you?" and all that, you know. Yeah, they sniffed a bit of money, I suppose. <laughs> well, I like the first album because yeah. it's 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 uh, it's fresh and it's keen and it's it's I, it, I still listen to it actually, and um, 
you know, it's like any album, it's bits and bits. But I did like that, uh, the free 12-inch uh, single that was given away, uh, Action and Waiting. That was good fun. But, you know, there's bits and bits of all the albums I've enjoyed. As usual, I haven't got a, a, an answer to what my favourite album is, because I, I like three or four tracks off, off each album, you know, and it varies depending on what mood you're on to listening to. Some, some are good, some aren't. You know, that's all I can say, really, to be honest. Same, I suppose. That's what I could answer. It can't, can't be that, really, can it? I mean, it was... Uh, I mean, doing the first two albums was great fun, you know, in the first album. And, and um, some of the ones in the middle, we had a disastrous album, like 13th Floor Madness, didn't we, guy? That was like trying yeah. to do something completely different and get away from our sort of style, but, uh, but get a bit more musical. But... Um, it was awful. It was pretty much awful. Yeah. And uh, then we sort of came back to our roots and made another album, You Are It, which is one I think I quite like. It's probably one of my favourite ones with some of the songs on it. Yeah. Because it was a, it was a try to you know really get back to doing things again and, and start up a whole new beginning really, sort of for us you know and you know the great thing is that the music hasn't died. We're here now doing our thirtieth anniversary tour, right? You know, so you know and uh, you know it's. Music's lasted and the people still come and see us. What more can you say? Isn't it? We're still here, thank God. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously I knew all the early records. We all loved the singles and 909 and the Lurkers shared a lot of the Not same found out fans. too late. <coughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, I've only played on two new studio albums because we've only been so lazy that we've only made two in the last 16 years since I've been in the group. But, I mean, I think... The first two albums are really great, but also um, about an album called You Are Sit, which came out on um, on, on, on a label. Yeah. Oh God, it slips my mind. That's terrible. But uh, that is a really good album. Yeah, I think that was that's a good one. The best album since the first two, for me personally. And the last one, Takeover, that we made, which is very hard to get hold of these days, but uh, that's a great album too. But there's, there's so many good songs on every record, you know, it's hard to get complete 100% consistency on records over such a long period of time. But I would say the first two are pretty flawless, and I would say that You Us It is as well. But we, used to, we rehearsed at a squat, we did up a basement in a baker shop in Brixton, we used to rehearse there, and agents used to come down and watch us. And it was yeah, we did it all out in a nice style. We, it, it, it was like, we didn't know, it was just asbestos walls and, you know, I, I like Jackson Pollock, so I spat a paint all over the walls and things like that. And somebody forgot to turn the electricity off, so we, we had free electricity free down there. So I was quite lucky, yeah. but no toilet. <laughs> uh, yeah, the car accident. Um, November 1978, returning from Sweden. Uh, it's all a bit of a haze. But basically, uh, we had a van with a sliding door, shunk, and I leaned in to get something just as I was going home, and my hand got caught in the van. So I bang on the van, and they think I'm saying, see you next week, and they drive off with me hanging out the van. Um, and then this arm hit the back of a Morris Oxford, the wing, so that was smashed. Actually nearly got run over after that as well. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. I was lying in the road and John um, uh, uh, went to stop a car and they was not stopping and at the last second he sort of yanked me out of the way. So then it was, um, it was a pretty bad break and it was paralysed for a year or at least it took me a year till I could sort of even pick up a stick again. Well, weren't you told, Pablo, that you wouldn't even use it Yeah, again? they asked, actually, They're in the hospital. They said, aren't you a drummer, aren't you? And I said, uh, yes, I am. And he said, uh, well, I should think about a different profession if I were you. But with much perseverance, like a little rubber <laughs> ball. Because I remember... Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. You know, I used to go and see 909, and Pablo would be at some of the gigs when the other guy who took over, Ed, Ed, Case, Ed Case, was playing in Pablo's place. And as Pablo really given it, and he was so determined that he'd use that again, and it, he, he got it back. It was fantastic, you know. Yeah, it was... Absolutely fantastic. It was a bad time. Yeah. Pablo's car accident was a, a catastrophe for the band. Um, you know, we were right in the middle of a sort of world tour and this terrible thing happened and he bust his arm. Had to piece some of it. But, uh, it, you know, it was obviously necessary. We, we didn't want to stop and Pablo didn't want us to stop. So we carried on, didn't we, Guy? And we had a fan from the Southall crew called Ed Case. He was like 16, 17 years old at the time. 
and he was a drummer and he'd been to see every gig so he knew every song <laughs> off by heart so we just had one rehearsal with him and the next day he was playing a great big gig at the SO Footies Kicks Club in Berlin wasn't he like? yeah yeah mm. he was a good job I mean obviously what happened to Pablo it, it changes your perspective on things but but at the time like Nick said we're right in the middle of things so we sort of had to keep going so Ed who knew all the music and also it was similar to us in attitude and everything so he fitted in pretty well straight away and he was able to come and tour with us and tour in America but of course the problems because of his age and the clubs out there the drinking laws and everything so that was all a bit I had to paint moustache on him and stuff like that and make him look older you know but but I mean, he was, like, from that, it was all right. he was like driving around as a left school as a sort of dead end type jobs, and he never looked back from that. He went in to join Hazel O'Connor and uh, played in Hazel with Hazel O'Connor many years, and then he went on uh, to be a session drummer and played for many years as the drummer in Buddy at the uh, in Buddy the Musical down mm. at um, John Lennon. Yeah. And then Hazel. he became an actor because he got drumming so much his arms trouble with his arms, he became an actor. He was in a Renault advert and stuff like that. I think that's his main claim to fame. To, he hasn't quite been discovered yet, but I'm sure he will be. <laughs> Hollywood beckons. Yeah. I ended up joining the group in a really weird way. I mean, I left the Lurkers in November 77 and had a band called Pinpoint, um, which used to play a lot with 999 because we had the same management. And uh, obviously that uh, failed abysmally, but uh, I got the Lurkers back together in 1987, but I was a singer. I became a singer and uh, I was going along for a couple of years and then uh, a few years and uh, I, I saw 909's name in the paper, I knew they were still going but in 1991 sort of time my friend died of cancer and he was being cremated at uh, West Norwood Crematorium in London and I went down there and uh, I met Nick Cash at the gates of the crematorium and I thought, well, what? I said, Nick, what, what are you doing here? He said, well, I, I work here. I said, well, what do you do? He said, I operate the creme machine. So I said, well, I said my mate Dom's being cremated at half nine. He said, oh, come in my up for a cup of tea, just through the gates, like. And he said, oh, well, uh, what time is it? Half nine, yeah, I'm doing him. I said, I can't believe it. You're going to cremate my mate, you know. He said, yeah, yeah, I do it all the time. Oh, you know, they're dead now, aren't they? You know, you know, that thing when you're working with dead people or death, you get a really black sense of humour. Ambulance people, coppers, the people who scrape people off the lines do. But, um, yeah, so that, that's what happened, and Nick was going, oh, we're having a lot of trouble with a bass player at the moment, because they had a friend, of old school friend of um, Pablo's playing called Danny Palmer, and Danny was being really inconsistent, so Nick said to me, well, would you want fancy giving it a go? And he knew I had a van, and none of the van drive, and he said, what are you doing on Wednesday? I said, uh, nothing. He said, will you drive us to Brighton? So I drove him to Brighton, and sure enough, Danny didn't turn up, so I ended up having to play. I just made a load of notes out, and I know the songs over the years in my head, and... Uh, Played. I made two mistakes, Nick made four, Guy made three, Pablo made none. That was quite a weird sort of initiation into it and then I was in, you know, and I've been doing both groups ever since. So and I love it. It's my life. Totally. Danny wasn't inconsistent playing. Brilliant bass player. Oh no, I didn't say Danny. No, I know, was. no, but you said inconsistent. I'm just clearing it up for Danny. Oh no. Yes, you're absolutely right, he was a great bass player, but he started going a bit wobbly towards the end, didn't he? Yeah. Lovely bloke though. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That much talent, what? <laughs> <laughs> Arturo, yeah, well, we, we then, and then, that we really, we haven't really been through many uh, bass player changes. Anyway, John Watson left. Basically, he, he'd had enough, and he wanted, this is for the same people listening, I mean, he wanted to manage the band for a while. He wasn't happy with the way that things were going at the end of Albion, was he, Guy? It was a, we were in a very bad period because we were under heavily under contract to EMI Records and Albion Records. We couldn't break free of those contracts. When you sign, it's like the kiss of death. You know, you can't go and negotiate yourself another deal because these are, they've got you by the bollocks for another sort of five or six years. So John decided to manage the band and we tried to go live again and record our own stuff and bring it out on our own label as much as we possibly could, you know? And um, so when, when, when the period of time came up for the records, we, we you know, release for the contract. We had a record to go, but he wasn't really sort of happy with it, was he, guys? Just had no. enough, basically. Yeah, he gave it his best shot, and then that was the end of it, wasn't it? I think in fact he could know he'd run out of what he could input in, into the band, and it had sort of thought it's best to leave rather than just hang on in there, which is a good, you know, a good thing. And then we, so when he left, then we had to replace him. We replaced him with 
Danny Palmer, who, who Pablo knew. And then he can do some gigs or something like that, wasn't it? And then Art, so Arturo came in, who, who we knew on the circuit. We toured with him and he's in a band called Pinpoint and he knew the Lurkers. You know, he was, he was also managed that by Albion, was he? At so. one time, yeah. He was their tax loss. And uh, yeah, so he fitted in as well, just like that. And then from then on, we just carried on and here we are now.